Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third Slack public lecture of the year 2008. Um, it is a special pleasure to have Professor Harris Kagan here tonight. Uh, Professor Kagan is at in the physics department of Ohio State University in the high energy physics program. He has been a collaborator of the large Babar Slack uh, experiment since about five years. Um, he is from New York City, uh, Far Rockaway. When he was a student in Far Rockaway High School, he had a memorable event because a person who sounded like a truck driver came to school after winning the Nobel Prize. This was Richard Feynman. <laughs> the Harris had never thought that someone who talks like a truck driver could be so smart. <laughs> but it had a lasting effect and was partly the reason why he got into physics. And so listen carefully how Harris will speak tonight and don't think <laughs> he, he is a truck driver. Let me welcome Harris Craigen, The Mystery of the Diamond. Hello? Ah, very good. Thank you, Uvid, for that wonderful um, introduction. All of it is true, by the way. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is diamond. Diamond is a very unique material. Um, I got interested in diamond to solve a problem in high energy physics. And I'm going to take you through that path that we went through. I think this is too loud since I hear feedback. Um, uh, to discuss its unique properties, very amazing properties, which lead to this incredibly bizarre history of which I'll tell you about, and then at the very end, some of the unique applications. So you're probably familiar, all of you or most of you, with this type of diamond. This is a natural gemstone. You may even have some natural gemstones. I'm going to talk about the gemstones to start. But what's interesting is that there's many other ways to produce diamond than just naturally. In this middle figure, you probably these look like gems. They don't look much different. These are now synthetic gems, and they're produced. And there's a huge interplay now between what happens naturally and what happens synthetically. For me, this is the beauty of the diamond. This is a diamond detector, and I'm going to talk about this at the end. And so maybe this beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but we'll see if I can convince you that this is better looking than that. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Oops. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll be leaving now. Uh, what do I do now? There's a. Oh. On this thing. Okay. I just won't use that. Something is going. Can maybe I take this off? It'll be the old style. OK. So here we are. OK. Uh, can I use the pointer? Maybe I. OK. So <laughs> that's a good start. Diamond is composed of carbon. Um, there are, da, da, carbon is an element, and there are many forms of carbon. Diamond is just one of them. What I've shown on the left is graphite. Uva was nice enough to make a model, which we'll pass around, of graphite. And this is the, the stuff that's ordinarily in your pencils and the lubricants that you use on your bicycle are all based on graphite. And the reason for that is because you see these planes stacked above one another. There's a weak bond between them. In the plane, it's very strong. And so this sliding motion is very, very easy to happen in graphite. If you change graphite a little bit, you get this structure. This is the diamond structure. And you don't see any planes. There are none that slide against each other. This is a three-dimensional structure, rigid in all directions. It's this structure, if you like, which gives diamonds its properties of hardness and all the other properties which follow. There's other forms. There's actually eight forms of carbon that are bound. This is a very interesting one. I'm not going to talk about this, but I highly recommend you get someone to talk about this. This is a carbon nanotube, and this is used, or thought to be used, 
in biology to de deliver medicines, et cetera, in the future. And this is kind of nice. This you take one plane of the graphite and wrap it around in sort of a chicken mesh, and all of a sudden the human body likes it. So it, it really does well. So diamonds are produced at high pressure and high temperature. Ah, there's the diamond. Sure, pass them around. Okay. Uh, maybe I would just keep them for a second. Let me keep them to do one other demonstration before. So diamond is produced naturally at high pressure and high temperature. This is a plot of pressure in atmospheres. Notice this, this is 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, where 10,000 atmospheres is about 150,000 pounds per square inch, lots of pressure. And this is temperature in Kelvin, so room temperature is down here at about 300. And what you notice is there's a, there's a, a dividing line. If you get high enough pressure at a given temperature, you can produce diamond. There are many, many other things you see here. If you take diamond and you increase the temperature, it turns into graphite. That really does happen. And so um, that's why I wanted the model. If you then take graphite and you increase the pressure, squeezing on this, you break the bonds, and it turns into this. Now let me pass it around. OK, so how do you make diamond? Well, if you wanted to make a diamond at this point, this is sort of one of the places it occurs naturally, 55,000 pounds per, uh, 55,000 atmospheres, 750,000 pounds per square inch, just above the line at maybe 1,500 K, then the way you could do that is take the Eiffel Tower, turn it upside down, the Eiffel Tower is a heavy thing, put it on a five-inch plate and hold it there, and if that plate was made out of graphite, it would turn into diamond. Lots of pressure. So where do you get this much pressure to make diamond? Well, the answer is in the Earth. And the way this works is the Earth has a crust, very thin crust, maybe 35 kilometers thick, and then the mantle. As one gets closer to the core, of course, the temperature is increasing. That's tending to make more graphite. And you just have to be in the right place to have the conditions to make diamond above that line. And the conditions occur about 90 to 120 miles, 150 to 200 kilometers below the surface. So you might think, why aren't we just drilling for diamonds? Well, the deepest oil well is maybe five miles, something of that order. Very hard to go down 100 miles. Nobody knows how to do that. So if diamonds are formed 100 miles below the surface, how do they get to the surface? Well, the answer is volcanoes. If you have a volcano, and if the lava tube passes by a region where diamond is formed, then the lava can actually carry the diamonds to the surface. And what you would expect then, as the volcano cools down, this is millions and millions of years ago, is lining the walls of the lava tube, you should find diamond. Okay, And also, after the, after the volcano cools down and the uh, crown er erodes due to water and sun, etc., you would expect the diamonds which were ejected from the surface during the lava, as shown here, to wash down into the water basin, rivers, streams, etc. Okay. So how do you find diamonds? Well, these are pictures of diamond mines. The upper ones, this is Australia. Here's volcanic region, and you can see the digging into the tube of the, of the volcano. Here we are in Russia. Here in, we are in Africa. These are the three of the biggest diamond mines known today. But you can also find diamonds in the river streams of Africa or even on the sands where water used to pass, and that's what happens. But this doesn't happen everywhere. It happens in very, very small regions, mostly in Africa, a little bit of Australia, Russia, South America. There's a brand new diamond mine, which De Beers just bought in Canada. So you'll be lucky we'll be receiving diamonds from Canada soon. Okay. So this is a picture of a diamond as it comes out of a mine. It's a black volcanic rock or igneous rock, etc. And here is the diamond sitting in it. It doesn't look like a a gemstone yet, but this is an amazingly large piece of diamond. And when it's done and cut, cut in half and then faceted, this is a picture of the Hope Diamond. Again, a pretty amazing diamond. Diamonds are found in all colors. 
These are actually famous diamonds. If I was a gemologist, I would know the names of all of these. I don't, but I know where to go to find the pictures. They come in every color of the rainbow. And of course, what gives diamond its color is impurities. The diamond which is most highly prized is the clear or the white diamond. Everything else has impurities. The yellows and the orange have nitrogen in them, which is very natural in a volcanic activity. Deep under the earth, there's lots of nitrogen. The blue diamonds, the hope diamond is blue, has boron in it. All of the impurities absorb, have different absorption spectra and absorb different colors of light. And after they absorb those colors, the colors which are remain give diamond its color. But I must admit, these are pretty spectacular looking diamonds. Okay. There's also black diamond. This is a piece of diamond which was found in South America. It uh, comes from space. It's believed to come in the formation from a supernova. Any time you make or achieve the conditions of pressure and temperature and have carbon, you can make diamond. I think that's the message of this point. And so you make diamond, you can make diamond with dynamite. You can make diamond when a meteor, we have people, it's true, when meteors hit Earth. You can make diamonds outside of Earth, etc. Anyway. Carbonado, the diamond from South America. So what's the biggest diamond in existence? Well, this is it. This is Lucy. After Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, the Beatles song, it's a white dwarf, a star which is dying. Its interior was made of carbon, and it's cooled down. It's reached the condition now where the central interior, as made by measurements, is now a 2,500-mile wide diamond. Pretty amazing. It's 10 billion trillion trillion carats. I didn't check that number, but I did read it on the web. Okay. So you might ask, why are we going to Mars? Why aren't we going to Lucy instead? I don't know. Okay, so let me, now with a little bit of an introduction of how to find diamonds, now we can talk about the history of diamonds. So diamonds were found roughly 4,000 BC in the riverbeds of India. We understand that. That's the natural place to find these in river, riverbeds. We're not going to have digging equipment at 4,000 BC. And they're found because they glitter. Their ability to bend light gives them their ability to sparkle. And they're found just by picking up rocks out of the riverbed with water on it and then looking. Okay. For many years, of course, India was uh, the central producer of diamond, the only place diamond has been found. I did find this reference to about 3000 BC. I don't have a picture and I don't really understand it, but it says diamond is as hard as a rich man's heart. And it's a nice phrase and I'm wondering if, uh, if even in 3000 BC, rich men didn't have hearts. So maybe the first evidence of a rich poor dichotomy in the human race. Okay, about 800 BC, the first diamond mines are formed in India. This is a, a, a drawing. It's a little bit hard to see, but you see the scratching. These are picks depicting uh, people uh, chopping the rock inside of it. And this is a, a diamond which comes from India, really spectacular raw. You see the rock around it, and then you see this beautiful eight-sided diamond, sort of a prized possession. Diamond gets its name from the Greek word Adamas about 700 BC, unconquerable, indestructible adamant. People at that point realized how hard this material is. Um, diamond made its way, it's talked about in all along the trade routes, so you imagine that diamond is found in India and then travels all the way to Europe um, via the trade routes. It's used to, as a, a bartering tool, etc., but more importantly, it's used because of these magical properties, uh, the properties of strength, the properties of glitter, etc. 500 AD, we have a Hindu interpretation of diamond, I'm going to read this, of luck and protection. So this is from Buddha Bada. He who, having pure body, always carries a diamond with sharp points, without blemish, free from all faults, that one, as long as he lives, knows each day will bear some things, happiness, prosperity, Children, riches, grain, cows, and meat. He who wears such a diamond will see dangers recede from him, whether he be threatened by serpents, fire, poison, sickness, thieves, flawed or evil spirits. Sort of a nice idea. Luck and protection. By 1300, diamonds were believed to render their owner courage and 
fearlessness, diamonds were thought to be fragments of stars, teardrops of the gods, they possess magical quantities, and in fact, this is Charles V. He studded, put on his breastplates diamond studs because the belief then was that if you saw a warrior, a king or any warrior, with diamond on their breastplate, they were invincible, and you would run the other way, and that happened. People who had diamonds were invincible. Very nice concept. Okay. 1430, the wearing of diamonds is introduced in uh, the French court by Agnes Sorel. She was the mistress of Charles VII. Uh, she was reported to be an absolutely beautiful woman. This is a picture of Agnes. And Charles uh, adored her so much, he gave her this absolutely beautiful castle. Um, she died at a very early, early age, about the age of 28 or 29. She was poisoned. Uh, people didn't know she went poisoned. Then she just died. She got sick. But in 2004, her body was exhumed, and they found she was indeed poisoned by mercury. So who are the possible culprits? Of course, this is uh, a few hundred years old. So there was Charles's son, who apparently hated her. She was very extravagant. She interfered in the matters of state. She really helped France in, and, and the king in almost everything. And then there was the magistrate of the court who also hated her. Someone did a crime many, many years ago. I guess uh, diamonds did not protect her from evil spirits, poison, and all the other things. That's the message. Okay. 1477 is the first use of diamonds to symbolize love when Archduke Maximilian of Austria gives a diamond ring to Mary. Here's a picture of them. First use. Up until then, in the 1100s and 1200s, diamonds, there was a law in France that only diamonds could only be worn by the French kings. And that has to do with this protection, this being invincible, etc. Okay, 1813, a little bit of science, a very interesting experiment. How do we know diamond is made of carbon? Well, that was discovered in 1813 when Humphrey Davy burned a diamond in the presence of oxygen, and the only byproduct was carbon dioxide. He made a greenhouse gas by burning diamond. That doesn't ordinarily happen, but he did it. And so he concluded, but he did some very interesting things. He burned diamond in the absence of oxygen, and he turned it into graphite. He moved along that diagram changing the temperature, turning diamond into graphite. Unfortunately, he was not able to do the opposite of turn graphite into diamond. <laughs> or I wouldn't be here, probably. Okay. 1867, modern history of diamond. Diamonds are found in South Africa, and instantly the diamond mines of South Africa produce 10 times more diamonds than all the other countries of the world combined. Everyone at this time was finding diamonds in the riverbeds, and then after finding diamonds in the riverbeds of South Africa, they found the diamond mines. They discovered the trick of going to volcanoes and digging. And so most of the mines, then most of the diamonds, were coming from Africa. And about uh, 10 years, 20 years later, Cecil Rhodes, picture here, creates the Beers Consolidated Mines Limited. He had one concept. If you control the source of a, of a commodity, you can determine the price. Very well-defined concept in the capitalist system. And his goal was to control the diamond market. The British owned South Africa, or at least it was a colony, and he was there to control diamonds. And we'll see how he did. In the, it, during the war, um, De Beers had a problem because the Germans were trying to take over Africa. They had a stash, a reserve of many, many diamonds, and they were worried that the Germans would get all these diamonds, so they offered the U.S. should do them a favor and store the diamonds in America, and the United States refused. And the argument they gave is that De Beers is a monopoly, and we have laws against monopoly, the Sherman Antitrust Act, things like that. So De Beers and the United States went to war. I think De Beers won this one, but they went to war. By 1947, De Beers, of course, used diamond trade as an Antwerp and uh, Amsterdam, etc. Um, Drucker International to market diamonds. They didn't stop marketing diamonds in America, but they hired N.W. Ware as a consulting firm to come up with a phrase. They were worried that after the war, that the, the uh, demand for diamonds would go way down, and they couldn't tolerate that. Okay? So they needed a phrase, and the phrase that N.W. Ware has come up with is a diamond is forever. And they went out of their way to sell that here in America and everywhere in the world. This is an ad from a 1950 newspaper in New York. I'm from New York. 
A diamond is forever, big and bold, and you can see the price in 1950. Diamonds cost $125 to $1,250, presumed for a ring like that. 1953, of course, you have Carol Channing and then Marilyn Monroe singing Diamonds Are a Girl Best Friend, and uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And things really are taking hold. Switching back to the science a little bit, in 1954, GE, in a race with De Beers and Norton, the other two big companies, developed synthetic diamonds by mimicking the conditions in the Earth. That means high pressure, relatively high temperature. Okay. They did that on this press. This is a, a 1957 or 54 photo of the GE team. The guy who actually did the work, Tracy Hall, was the third one from the left. And his description of what he did when he saw it is, my hands began to tremble. My heart beat rapidly, my knees weakened, and no longer gave support. My eyes had caught the flashing light from dozens of tiny triangular facets of octahedral crystals, and I knew that diamonds had finally been made by man. The story of this is it's, it's very dramatic. It's a wonderful quote, and GE does have credit. They own the patent, which De Beers and um, Norton had to pay for them, but the story is that De Beers and Norton were doing this, and when I did a little bit of work with Norton many years ago, they claimed their patent was sent in 12 hours after the patent from GE, and they deserved to share the credit. And because they lost that patent, they lost billions of dollars, they claim. But anyway, that's history. So you can see the press, the screws, very old. This was the key, making the pressure. And GE was the first one to come up with it. In 1961, very shortly after man-made diamonds are made to mimic the natural conditions, this first patent for chemical vapor deposition growing diamonds out of a gas phase. And what's shown here is a picture of a substrate on which you're growing something and a beautiful plasma. And if you put the right gases into this source of energy, for some reason, diamond will grow. This is a picture of a diamond. Okay? It doesn't look like a gem. It's big, flat, clear plates. look like plates of glass. I brought a few of them if you want to see some diamonds grown from uh, chemical vapor deposition process after the talk. Okay, 1961, De Beers has the U.S. market. They need another market. So they looked elsewhere and they decided the natural target would be Japan. By 19, 19, up until about 1959, Japan didn't even import diamonds. By 19, 1961, Japanese marriages were governed by Shinto law, which basically means a, a tea ceremony. And so there was no need for a diamond ring. There was no exchange of, of uh, jewelry of that sort. So 1967, the ad campaign begins. About 5% of the Japanese engagements or marriages use diamond rings. Uh, well, OK, let me skip to 1972. Uh, five years later, 27% of the marriages now are importing diamond rings. By 1981, a mere 14 years after the start of the campaign, 60% of Japanese marriages are sharing diamond rings. And Japan is now the second biggest importer, second only to the United States, of diamonds from De Beers. You'd have to argue that this concept, a diamond is forever, is perhaps the best advertising campaign ever. And it really worked. And of course, 1971, it helped a lot that diamonds are forever. And the mystique. And here is Jane Bond, this nice, debonair, rich man posing as a diamond agent about to save the world from a diamond laser in space, or something like that. OK. Things were going pretty well, and then the exposés started. 2002, the book by Greg Campbell, Blood Diamonds, illustrating what happened the last 100 years in Sierra Leone, and how the beers although they're nominally outwardly against um, using slave labor and using uh, the tactics that are used to force people to pan for diamonds, are secretly securing the diamonds to control the diamond market, part of that original plan of controlling the supply. A second book, Glitter and Greed, details the secrets of the world of the diamond cartel. And so amidst all that, 2004, no one from De Beers is allowed in the United States. They, they still are at war with the United States. In 2004, the United States, George Bush, needs help. He needs help fighting terrorism. And who is he going to get? De Beers. And what's his deal? 
we'll let you back into the United States if you just stop all of these blood diamonds from funding terrorist or revolutionary activities. And De Beers agrees. So they plead guilty to price fixing. This was an old charge for industrial diamonds that was in conjunction with General Electric. General Electric got off because there were, the charges may or may not have been true. De Beers agrees to plead guilty and pay a $10 million fine. It sounds like a lot of money, but just wait. Then, of course, because now they're in the United States, they can be sued. De Beers starts getting sued. Pretty soon, they owe about $220 million for price fixing of jewelry. And in fact, if you bought jewelry in the last 10 years, you're entitled to a piece of that settlement. And you may still even be able to get it. So they pay $230 million. Why would a company do that? Well, the answer is clear. In 2005, the US sale topped $6.5 billion. And it's the US market which they're after. So here you have the, the bloodshed, the terror, the greed amidst people searching and looking for these very nice small stones. OK. Things are not over because in 2007, a new company, Apollo Diamond, starts mar marketing gemstones grown out of a gas phase. That plasma I showed you is now not just growing small pieces. These are gems which come from chemical vapor deposition diamond, growing diamonds from the gas. Okay, in other words, making the right conditions. I'm going to show a little movie how that happens in a second. Here's what a raw diamond looks like. Here is the chairman, Richard Linares. This is a, a, one of his deposition or growth machines. And he needs a new phrase, and his phrase is nature perfected because these diamonds are purer than natural. They have no impurities in them. They're all white diamonds. These diamonds have no occlusions. They can grow them as good as they want. And of course, now you probably have seen there's an advertising campaign from De Beers again basically saying that these are not natural. <laughs> They're not natural, <laughs> or they are. So this is a very interesting. This is the card of, of the chairman, Robert. And I met him a couple of times. And I said to him, there's no address on this card. And he said, yes. I said, well, suppose I wanted to come and visit. He said, yes. And I said, well, where are you? He said, I'll meet you at the airport. <laughs> and so you know, that immediately, I said, well, why is that? And he's worried. He's worried about De Beers. He's worried about losing his secrets. He's worried about losing his ability to produce jumps. So he claims he only wants a, between 100 million and a 500 million dollar market. Remember, the market is 6.5 billion. And he's hoping he can sneak in there, make his money, and be left alone. But this reminded me of a story. So many years ago, uh, probably 15 years ago or 18 years ago, I gave a, a, a talk at Cornell University. And in the audience was Robert Wilson, who, for those of you who don't know, was a, is a pretty famous physicist. He was the guy who built accelerators at Cornell, Cornell Electron Storage Ring. And he, um, he built the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Chicago. And I'm in the midst of giving my talk like this. And right in the middle of the talk, he stands up. And he was a bit of a crazy guy. He stands up, and he starts talking about diamonds. And so I sit down. He's giving the talk. And <laughs> it's, it happens at Cornell. And he tells this story that he was one of the first people ever to work on diamonds. And uh, he called someone from Drucker. That's the De Beers arm in, in uh, Amsterdam. And he said he'd like to have a few diamonds. And so this, the, the, he got, when he first called them, he just got an answering machine, a service. And then this guy called back and said, what do you want? He said he wants some diamonds. He wants to look at their properties. The guy said, no problem. And he hangs up the phone. And so Bob says, well, he, he didn't know what to do. The guy just hung up the phone. So OK, months and months go by. It's now Christmas Eve in Ithaca, New York. I don't know if you've been to Ithaca. It's a very small town. And, um, and so Bob gets a call. It's this salesman. He says, come to the Ithaca bus station. OK, now, you can imagine what the Ithaca bus station. It's like 10 o'clock at night. So, so Bob, and his, he goes down to the Ithaca bus station, and the guy is sitting there. And he opens this bag, and he's got hundreds of these little diamonds. And they're about the size of his pinky, one the size of a thumb. And Bob's running his hands over, you know, millions of dollars. I don't know, lots of diamonds. And the guy says, well, what do you want? He said, you wanted a couple, pick two. So he picks two diamonds out. And the guy wraps up the diamonds, puts them away in his pocket. And Bob says to him, you know, I don't understand this. You're carrying millions of dollars of diamonds. Aren't you afraid of being robbed? And he says, no, I have no address. Nobody can reach me. I call people. I give them a half hour to meet me at some bus station or some train station. They show up. There are two people hiding in the woods in case there's any trouble. 
After 30 minutes, I'm gone. And that's the way this diamond business was done in the 1960s. So anyway, so Robert is worried about all this. No address, just a phone number, you get an answering machine. Okay, so what's the history characterized by? Extreme properties, extreme violence, a disconnect from perception and reality. On the one hand, blood diamonds. On the other hand, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Okay, why is this? Well, you just have to look at a little bit of the numbers. So this is a table of the annual worldwide diamond market. The natural dem stones is about 30 million carats. A carat is about 0.2 grams. Okay, so it's a, it's a measure of weight, for those of you who don't know. I didn't know. I mean, I, mean, I know now, but I didn't know before I started in diamonds. And um, the way I think about diamonds is it's two square centimeters, a half a millimeter thick. I know that sounds crazy, but you'll see why at the end. So this is a carat, 30 million carats, 6.6 .6 tons, about a $10 billion market, natural gemstones. Natural industrial, the leftovers from these, the things which can't be made in gemstones, crust, etc., about 100 million carats. So you can immediately see there's about a 25 or 20 percent success rate in making uh, gems, etc. Most of what's found falls into natural industrial. 22 tons, about a one and a half billion dollar, three times as much, ten times less in profit or money. High pressure synthetics, the GE process, squeeze them, mimic the conditions in the earth. About 400 million carats, 88 tons, but only about a $2 billion market. And finally, this growing the diamonds from the gas phase, relatively new, now makes 600 million carats, dominated by the Chinese, by the way. Okay, 132 tons, but less than a billion dollars. So what did we say? We said when we wrote our first proposal, there's a really cheap way to make diamond. If we could only harness this growing diamonds from the gas phase, maybe we can use them and solve some problems in physics. And that's what I want you to keep in mind as we go through the second half of the talk. Okay, the results under these conditions are not surprising. This is a New York Times article. These little dots are people, these holes are diamond mines, and this is it says, like ants on a barren landscape, wildcat miners dig for diamonds along the Congo River of Angola. And this is happening all over in Africa. The headline, De Beer may be losing grip on the diamond market. So, what, was, what did De Beers get out? They paid their fine. What did they have to do for the United States? They had to figure out a way to stop this and let the diamonds that are so-called not De Beers or GE or one of the big companies come into the market. And we'll know soon whether they actually can do that. And as a result, they're back in the U.S. market. Even though they're a monopoly, they're allowed. Only monopoly left. Okay. If one wants to look at the properties of carbon or diamond, the way I would do it or what I did do is just look at a periodic table. And if you remember, in a periodic table, elements in the same column all have similar properties. So that says carbon and silicon and germanium should all be the same. In fact, in the history of semiconductors, when scientists first attempted to make the first transistor, they did not first try in silicon, they tried in carbon, in diamond. And it didn't succeed for technical reasons, mostly impurities in natural diamond. But if things had been a little bit different, you might not have Stanford next to Silicon Valley, but of course next to Diamond Valley. But it didn't work out that way. So diamond and silicon germanium share the same structure that's being passed around, many of the same properties. But as you move towards lower and lower or higher in this periodic table, lower atomic number this way, you find the bonds are shorter, the material is stronger, etc. As you move down, weakness, etc. So what are some of the properties of diamond? Diamond, if you look at it, has the highest number density. That's number of atoms. Now if you hold up those models, hold up the models. Number of atoms per cubic centimeter. It's small, it's very dense, the atoms can stack in. If you look at diamond, after diamond, the next thing you see in our universe is the neutron star. There's nothing in the middle. And so you have iron, which we think of a hard material. At a half, you have diamond at about one. I've scaled it so the, the density is one in some arbitrary unit. 
the neutron star is a one with 14 zeros. Just that one I calculated, just to set the scale. Okay, so neutrons are nuclear, nuclei pushed together, these are atoms pushed together. But all of the properties are somehow related to this density, the hardness, the, uh, well, we're gonna see, the hardness, the thermal conductivity, electrical, so, diamond is the hardest known substance. That's one of the reasons it was discovered. It's as hard as a rich man's heart. We know that, it must be true. That's pretty hard. Diamond has the highest of any material thermal conductivity. And that's a little bit surprising because we usually think of electrical conductors as good thermal conductors. But diamond is not a good, uh, it is, oh, it's not a good electrical conductor. It's electrical insulated, yet it's an incredibly good uh, thermal conductor. Okay. It's actually about four or five times that of copper, and I'm going to show you a, a wonderful experiment I just did and videotaped for you to demonstrate this, to actually make a measurement of the ratio of the thermal conductivity. Diamond has the best strength to weight ratio. The number two material, if you could afford it, is beryllium. And that's what's used in most of the space missions. Diamond has many other properties. It beads or sheds water like a freshly waxed car, but sticks to grease. In fact, one of the methods used to separate diamonds is to grease a wooden table, pour the rocks on it, and wash them off, and everything that sticks is a diamond. This is a picture of a diamond and a bead of water. And you can use this trick if you ever have to uh, figure out whether you have a real diamond or not. It's one of the many. Okay, thermal conductivity. So here we go. This is a real-time experiment. There's two devices, diamond and copper. These are my hands. One piece of ice cube. I'm holding the two ends, using the heat from my hand to conduct it in through the material and cut the ice cube. Everybody understand the experiment? So you're watching me, this is one and then the other, the diamond's already in the ice cube, I've got to talk a little quickly, the copper's having a bit of problem. And so, um, the idea being that if we make the two materials the same size, same thickness, same height, same width, same length, then indeed the only parameter left is the thermal conductivity. And so by doing this, oh, diamond is done, the ice cube is stuck back together, here it is up here at the end of the experiment, if we do this, now I have to kill some time because I have a factor of five left in time before this one, we know that. If you do that, then you can make a measurement. So I've done this experiment the first time I tried holding, you know, I do this at, at, for party tricks, of course, and I just cut it like this and then uh, the ice cube sticks together, it's pretty amazing. And in fact, I would say most of the people who work in diamonds are hooked by one or more of these properties. They see something, they do something, and they just say, this is amazing. And the cutting of ice cube is pretty amazing. So I was still working on the copper. So um, I did it wrong two or three times because now I had to do, put some science in. And one of the things was I didn't have the copper and the diamond the same thickness. And when I finally got it right, I was just totally amazed. So I make this measurement. My friend is videotaping me. And this time is 40 seconds to cut through a diamond cube. I flip the diamond around. You can see it's the same cube. And this one is 205 seconds, which is about five. And so I do it again, and it's re amazingly reproducible. And so this, I decided, is a wonderful science fair experiment. If I get another high school student, and they want to do something, I'll invent, uh, or suggest to them some way of doing thermal conductivity measurements with ice cubes. I sort of really like the idea now. Anyway, we're waiting because uh, uh, the copper is not doing its job. Now remember, copper is a good conductor. You wouldn't try to cook with a copper pot, with a copper handle. You'd be burned, that would be crazy. Imagine what happens if you had a diamond there, five times the conductivity, it would be amazing. So I'm about to start losing patience and you know, doing the usual wiggle, breaking, everything else. So as soon as this is done, just so you can see me, I think that's the, and then we'll go on with, uh, and finish up, I hope, soon. I can tell another joke. Anyway, here we go. I'm starting to wiggle. I'm losing patience. And eventually, I've melted away. You can see so much of the ice cube that the, the ice cube wouldn't stick back together. It's sort of fun to watch the wiggle. Anyway, it takes a lot of patience to do this. But uh, I would say in the end, it's, I, I fell in love with this video. Uh, it took eight hours to do this, so I have to be in love with it. <laughs> because what else? how else am I going to justify it? Here we go. I'm wiggling. And with just about the usual method, 
I'm just about finishing. Okay. This is a good conductor. Remember that. So I, there it is, finally. Ah, very good. Yes. yes. Okay. So what are the properties, other properties? Diamond can withstand this tightly bound lattice means it's very hard to knock one of these carbon atoms out of the lattice, and that makes it very resistant to radiation. What the radiation we're talking about? Well, alpha particles, helium nuclei, or beta particles or gamma, the three types, or any other subatomic particle which is at high speed. Alphas, as you know, or as you can see, you get stopped by paper. Betas can go through paper, you do aluminum, photons, gammas, usually need some form of lead. Diamond can detect all of them and is insensitive in the sense of being damaged by any of them. And that's the property I'm going to talk about at the end. So, if indeed we bootstrap on this growing diamond from a gas vapor, maybe it's even going to be really cheap. I didn't mention it with the table, but you can see you produce many, many more carats, much more weight of diamond by the gas, and yet you, it, the, the dollars you get are very, very small. So, diamond could be this ideal detector material for high energy frontier. So, what type of diamond? Well, when we started, as Bob Wilson's story, he started with natural diamond, as most of us did. It has nice colors, it's single crystal, but it's way too many impurities, and the impurities not only get it color, which make it look, but they, they prevent us, they make it sensitive to radiation, they prevent us from doing the measurements we want. So it's too small and, of course, too expensive. In terms of uh, square centimeters per half a millimeter, it's about $10,000. Remember, two of these is a carat, so it's about $10,000 for the quality we need per half carat, $20,000 per carat. The GE type synthetic diamond, single crystal, it's too small, $2,000 per half carat, $4,000 a carat. The, the growing diamond from the gas phase, you can grow single crystal or polycrystalline. I showed from Apollo Diamond, they use this to grow gemstones, single crystal. It's very high purity, no known defects. It's right now about $1,000 per square centimeter at 500 microns. So, but the price is dropping, and it's cheaper than anything else. So how does this growing diamond from a gas phase work? Well, it's actually very simple. Um, you take a hydrocarbon, methane, any gas which has the elements of life, hydrogen and, and carbon. You can even throw in a little bit of oxygen. You add hydrogen, and that's a critical step. That's what made this process, hydrogen. You add energy. The energy can be anything from uh, a plasma, it can be an oxyacetylene torch. It can be a microwave oven. It can be anything. And you make a plasma with this stuff. That makes, breaks up the hydrogen into atomic hydrogen, breaks up the methane into methane radicals. And if you do the right thing, then you get carbon in this form instead of this form. Remember, it's much easier to grow in this form. You have to wait a long time. OK. so. This is just a picture showing the gases come in, hydrogen gas and methane. This is where you put in the energy, some energy source. And what you've got here is these free radicals which flow around and somehow stick to the surface. So this is a two-dimensional movie I made yesterday, the day before, of diamond. So here's the carbon atoms stuck together. The diamond, I didn't say this, but the reason diamond is usually sheds all this water is it has a, a surface attachment to hydrogen. That's what it likes to do, and that makes it very hard to stick to. And so here's the two hydrogen bonds, and there's a hydrogen about to now hit this and grow a diamond. Remember, this is two dimensions, and it really occurs in three dimensions, but you can get the idea. Here's the hydrogen. It knocks a hydrogen off. Here's a Methane radical comes in and sticks, a hydrogen knocks the other hydrogen, another one sticks, a hydrogen comes in, activates the two, and the carbon sticks together. Now, this doesn't always happen. You, the reason you need time is sometimes you form graphite and you have to get rid of the graphite. I didn't make a movie to do that. It would take too hard. But you can see, and this goes on, you now have the hydrogen sticking in two directions, and if the thing produces again, you will continue to grow. Um, what do the machines look like? Well, this is a microwave machine. That microwaves come in, like your microwave oven, only bigger, different wavelength or frequency. You have a bell jar, gas flows in. You have a vacuum pump, and at very low pressure and relatively low temperature, you form a plasma, and you make diamond on a substrate. 
This is a, a drawing of just an oxyacetylene torch, etc. And so you can make it. This is a machine from Norton. Uh, you can look in and actually see their plasma. This is a machine from a company called Crystalum, which was right around here many years ago. Crystalline, another company right around here. And you can see the substrates, you can see the beautiful glowing plasmas adding energy to these gases growing diamond. Uh, it's another pretty picture. This is the one I like the best. One of the first things I learned was that if you have an oxyacetylene torch or know someone who has a torch or go to a, a places where they use torches, even an automobile plant, and you're willing to get on your hands and knees and go through the black stuff on the floor, a lot of it is junk, but a lot of it is diamond. Oxyacetylene torches grow diamond. I'm going to show an example of what we've done with that in a sample. So here we go. These are the diamonds. If you get the right conditions, you can grow individual. These are very, very small. You need an electron micrograph to see these, but very small diamonds. You can draw plates. You can draw this fluffy stuff. You can draw bigger plates. But these two are really interesting. So many years ago, I do a lot of work, um, you know, uh, working with high school students and public school students for science fairs. It's sort of an outreach program we have at Ohio State. And so I got a student, a friend of mine's daughter, wanted to grow diamonds. She'd read this article, and I said, great. How hard could it be to grow some diamond? I'd been working in the field. And these are, her pic these are pictures she took. We got an oxyacetylene torch in the student shop at Ohio State University, and she spent hours and hours adjusting these chemicals. And lo and behold, here are, these are incredible pictures of diamonds she grew. She was in eighth grade, and she went all the way through the states and ended up winning the state science fair in eighth grade. And so uh, this really can be done, and it's not that hard. Okay. This is the polycrystalline side view. You can see it. You're supposed to see this columnar structure. It's a little bit hard. This is about a 2.3 millimeter thick diamond. This is a millimeter scale, and you can see it. The, the, the grains grow together if you start with the wrong substrate. If you start with a single crystal, you grow single crystal. Whatever you have in the substrate, this machine copies. And so you can grow wafers black if you grow it too quick white, if you grow it slower, or once the white ones are polished, they actually come out clear, just like gemstones. These are pretty big inches. You can cut them and finish parts. You really handle them like a material. The technology to do this is all set up, not a problem. And as a result of this, there's articles which came out, diamond power, diamond could be high tech's best friend. And so I think what I'd like to spend the last 10 minutes is talking a little bit about the applications <coughs> that we're using. So there's some pretty amazing applications you don't think about. One of them is wear resistance. Diamond is a very hard material, very hard to wear. If you put two parts diamond against diamond, it lasts for a long time. So where do you need a place with metal parts rub against metal where you can't lubricate them. Well, outer space. And so it turns out that the space shuttle has diamond coating on all the hinges. And there's no lubricant. The lubricant wouldn't last once it's flying up there. It would just evaporate, et cetera. And there are diamond coatings on these hinges, on the arms, et cetera. Pretty amazing. So you need then, you can't do this by high pressure. You need this, a gas. You need to be able to spray this diamond onto these parts. And this, Growing diamonds from the gas they've allowed this to occur. Cutting tools, these are tools which are grown where you coat them. They can be steel and then coated. They last a long time. The drill bits that are used to drill for oil are now diamond tipped or diamond. They cost about twice as much as a normal uh, steel bit, but they last 10 times as long, so it's a pretty good deal. Now I finally get to my detectors, particle detectors, these big flat things that uh, you can see the black line under. This actually has contacts, gold contacts, and you can see the speckles, there they are, that come from the surface because this is an unpolished diamond. And so, why did we want to do this? Well, I'm by trade a high energy physicist, it might not look like it, but I am, and in high energy physics we investigate the properties and interactions of matter at very small distances. And what that means is we have to go to high energy to do this. We build microscopes to look at things. This is the Babar experiment. You have pictures of the lab and the various experiments. There's the Babar silicon tracker, et cetera. This is what this lab does. And it's a big microscope, I agree, but that's because it goes to very, very high energy. And the way we observe things then is we assemble a series of detectors at precise locations and we tech 
the remnants of something which passes by them. It's very important for the detector material to be able to see or observe that something has passed through it. And in this picture, which is a, actually a, a, a picture from, uh, well, this would win a Nobel Prize if it occurs in the next year or so. Um, the, the red things and the white things are particles which are flying around in space. There's lots of them, but the only ones which are interested are these four yellow lines. And you have to be able to pick these four yellow lines out from all this other stuff. Pretty hard to do. So, second application, which is what we did here, is when you have accelerators like we have here, Accelerators make mistakes, believe it or not, and beams can go flying in all directions. And uh, so this is a proton beam. This is Fermilab outside of Chicago, another accelerator. It's a proton accelerator. And this is the proton beam, and it went around 20 times. This is stainless steel. And what you can see is the proton beam had so much energy, it drilled a hole in the stainless steel. Okay, if it had hit an experiment, of course, it would have ended the experiment. And so this is a picture of one of the experiments at, in Europe, which is about to occur, where one proton, not going around the whole beam going on 20 times, the energy is so high that one proton hits a, a piece of metal, and all of these blue, yellow, green are the particle spray which comes out. So this clearly has to be prevented, or at least if it happens, it has to be measured so that detectors can do something. So how does diamond work as a particle detector? Well, it's very simple. You take a block of diamond, you put some contacts, which can be almost anything. The first way we measured diamond was we took two washers, copper washers, we squeezed them onto a diamond, and we were able to see signals. It was that easy. So any metal, a particle goes through, it creates what are called ionization, electron and hole pairs. This ionization drifts, you apply a voltage to the two ends of the diamond, and you see something. And that's what we do. So, the first use in high energy physics is in Babar. These are actually the Babar diamonds. This is the beam pipe of that vertex detector in Babar. This is actually the diamond installed. So, there's a story. This is when I first joined Babar. I came to my first meeting here. And it's not so easy to get here from Ohio. I mean, it's, it's after all. Anyway, so, uh, so I get here, we go to the meeting, and the vertex detector is taken out for repair. The beam pipe is sitting there, and, and one of my collaborators, who's now the chair of the physics department, Pat Burkett of Stanford, says, you know, we've been talking about building these diamond detectors. Could we, like, build them and install them? I said, well, what's the time scale? So she says, well, we're closing up on Monday. This is last two, previous Tuesday. So I end up with a colleague of mine. We, I'm going to my first meeting. I'm supposed to be here. We fly back to Ohio, because this is a golden opportunity. Nobody would have diamonds, no one in high energy physics. They were just a little too risky five years ago or six years. We fly back to Ohio and we take this diamond, we metalize it, you can see the contacts on the edge, and now we have to make a contact. We didn't really know, well, we had normally done wire bonding or high tech, but we didn't have any packages or anything, so we said, oh, we'll just solder to it. We'll put gold on the surface and we'll solder. And then we made another big mistake. Scientists make a lot of mistakes. We didn't remember about the thermal conductivity, so we solder the first wire, no problem. We turn it over, we solder the second wire, and now this is a Three Stooges. The first wire comes off. <laughs> so we turn it over and we solder, and pretty soon we get the message, ah, thermal conductivity. So we make a jig, and here are the diamond. We did succeed. We did succeed. Here it is, soldered. It's wrapped in Kapton and installed on the beam pipe. Now, this must be important. The reason I say it must be important was I found yesterday in Wikipedia the following quote. Diamond shows great promise as a potential radiation detection device. It is employed in applications such as the Babar detector at Stanford. <laughs> so we did make it. Okay, so what is the message that I would leave with you? Diamond has extreme properties. I hope I've showed you that. And as a result of these properties and not understanding them, a very bizarre history. Natural diamonds are made deep in the earth and brought to the surface by volcanoes. Synthetic diamonds can be made by either mimicking the conditions in earth or by growing them from a gas. Both of those have been done. Synthetic diamonds grown from a gas are already used in industry and physics applications. I think I've showed that and shows great promise for the future. Thank you. Are you want to eat something? All right. No, I'm okay. I woke up. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you, Harris.
I did, do have some diamonds here if you want to see them and cut some ice or do something. Thank you for this most fascinating lecture. And we have time for questions. Ah, so it's a very good question. I, I didn't uh, say that. So, um, you, diamonds grow in this gas phase. Well, let me start. In Earth, millions of years. And the reason for that is because chemistry tells us that the rate of a reaction depends on the temperature. And if you don't go to very high temperatures, things really slow down. And just to set the scale, something you might want to remember, for every seven degrees, it's a factor of two in speed of a reaction. So in Earth, they take a long time. Now, growing diamonds in the gas phase, you can adjust it. The reason people go to high temperature is because they want to speed things up. The temperature is maybe 1,000 degrees C in this gas phase, and then you grow one millionth of a meter, oh, I'm sorry, one millionth of a meter per hour. But that's pretty fast. On the scale of growing diamonds in the Earth, that's very fast. So if you wanted to grow, let's just do the calculation, a millimeter thick, 25th of an inch thick, how many hours is that? What is that? No, a thousand hours. Millionth of a meter. Millionth of a meter. A thousand hours. So it's not so bad. It's, uh, it's 50 days to grow a millimeter thick diamond. That's probably just about right. Now, you can grow it faster. The beauty is that you can tune the rate if you add impurities, and the impurity which is added is nitrogen. If you don't mind yellow diamond, you can grow it 100 microns or even 500 microns per hour. The stuff we grew in the oxyacetylene torch, we grew those diamonds in 40 minutes. So if you're willing to have low quality, loaded with impurity diamonds, you can grow it as fast as you want to first order. Does that answer your question? Okay. In the white. In the, go ahead, in the white, please. No, I don't think De Beers, De Beers already um, owns as a reserve. It's in their interest to keep the supply of diamonds limited because they have a huge reserve. They do that by controlling the Russian diamonds, which was a huge reserve. They've made that contract. They've done that by entering into a contract with Canada. And I don't see them losing their monopoly status at all. Um, what happens with the United States in the future in the next administration, now that they're back in the country, I don't know. We, we don't allow monopolies. Well, we allow Microsoft. Maybe we do allow monopolies. <laughs> but uh, I don't know the So I don't see that changing at all. It just, it, they're just too powerful to allow that to happen. OK. I think everyone who does this, and there are many, many people trying to grow the synthetic gemstones, they talk about taking a hundred million dollars of market. Nobody is trying to compete at the ten billion dollar level with De Beers. De Beers will do something drastic. And I think I've showed they're capable of that if anyone challenges them. Like causing wars? Like causing wars, yes. I cannot, but I, there are many people who do. Um, th this company, Apollo, works with a company whose name I don't remember in Boston, which specializes in doing that. But the first thing you have to learn is the four. I've added one, the five C's of diamond. And so that's cut and color and clarity and uh, what's the last? Carrot, the weight, and then, of course, cost. And so, um, yeah, I can't do that. But it can be done. De Beers, you have to ask, why does De Beers, are they interested in high temperature, high pressure synthetics, and why are they interested in growing diamonds from a gas phase? And the answer is to protect the gemstone market. They claim that any diamond that's grown in this gas phase they can tell is not natural. I don't know if that's true. They claim that. Everyone is now marking their diamonds, including Apollo diamonds. So if you get a diamond, it should say DB on it if you wanted to be his diamond. Otherwise, it'll have one of the other company markings. That's part of this agreement with the United States. Um, 
Okay. I don't think that's true, but I do think it is true that there, there are very few uh, diamond cutters left to use this, um, you know, a, a tapping method. They're all done by automatic machines called an octopus. And um, you calculate. You can't get every fast. When you're cutting a diamond, you're, you're interested in making the diamond glow, be it bright, and making it sparkle. And to do that, you need to cut the angles exactly to the angles you want. They adjust those angles for brightness and, and fire or sparkle. You can't have an incredibly bright diamond with colors and sparkles because the brightness overshadows it. And so they tune that. And so um, there's a program that you run. I, this is all I know. I'm not a gem cutter. That you say, I want 128 facets, and your program it is. And this little machine looks like a mill. Look up octopus on the web. It, web and it turns the diamond and cuts the facets. They grind them off. They don't cut them anymore. They grind them. Well, okay. So you mean gemstone, or you mean? Okay. The largest that I know about was Norton made a nose cone for a rocket because diamond is transparent to most radiation. And so that was a piece about like that, freestanding diamond. The spray-on method you can spray on almost anything. So uh, the largest freestanding piece is maybe like that, and in the shape of a nose cone. That means they made a substrate which had the inner walls of a nose cone, and they rotated it and, and grew the diamond in that. You're only limited by the, maybe I should answer it really much more appropriately. You're limited by the microwave. If you make a microwave machine, you're limited by the wavelength of microwave before you get interference effects. So you have to change the microwave frequency, which is very costly. These are very high power microwave machines, and so typically people grow six inches. But there's nothing that says you couldn't grow larger, no fundamental limit. I don't know the answer to that, actually. My guess is they do, but I don't know the answer to that. I've never done that experiment. I just have three more questions. Yes. Yes. Did that work? The second question is that I understand that it is possible to detect a synthetic diamond versus a natural De Beers diamond through some kind of ultraviolet light. Well, I don't know if the first question, if De Beers image has improved. Um, the U.S. is the largest market. Japan is the second largest market. We don't have problems with them. They help us fight terror or terrorists. They're doing what they can for their image. That's their issue. Um, if you speak to the people at Apollo, or people who make diamonds out of a gas phase, they will tell you they know of no way to tell. They can add impurities. So if they want you know, one part per billion boron, they can add that. They can add nitrogen. They can really mimic. So the only thing that I could imagine that it would do is the distribution of impurities is what you might be able to do. But that's such a hard experiment. It is true that if you, if you there's a, there was a PBS story about De Beers, not very flattering, but in the PBS story, De Beers did say that they can tell every, and indeed their research program on chemical vapor deposition is the largest, the gas phase growing of any company I know. And indeed, there may be something about that growth that only they know, but I can't help you there. Yeah, the seed crystals are gone in these. They're cut away. Yeah. In fact, that, if that, maybe that's what they said originally. In fact, the, the interesting, the, the very interesting thing about what the Apollo does is they, you, someone asked the question about the seeds, and you need a seed. They grow their own seeds. So this process is you, make a, you get a, a high temperature, high pressure synthetic GE diamond. You grow diamond on it. You slice it with a laser, and all of a sudden you have more substrates. So it's, it's a very interesting process. You're really growing diamond on diamond. So we have one more in the back, and then I have one for you as well, and then two more here. <laughs> and then we meet okay. for um, cookies outside. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Nobel Prize was given out for that. Absolutely wonderful physics and a wonderful experiment. Um, yeah, the only material that's known that can stand those pressures is diamond cut in a particular shape. I don't have any transparencies on it, but really, really nice experiment. It's a diamond anvil. You take two diamonds, imagine two gemstones, and you can compress a material to enormous pressures and then shine a laser in and look at the excitation spectrum. And that's... And then your question. I didn't hear. Can they be mixed with other minerals? Sure. Um, the, 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 you can do this, okay, so how would you do that? Well, if you're growing it in the gas phase, for, okay, let me start again. First, you grow diamond, when, when we grow our diamonds, we grow them on tungsten, something that forms a carbide. So you need something which attaches itself to a carbon atom. And so chromium, titanium, tungsten, all form carbides, okay? And so if you're interested in, in putting some of those materials in the diamond, no problem. It will go in almost automatically. That is, what, what I'm saying is that the size of those atoms almost fits. It's still a little bit too big, but the way it bends the lattice, the way it takes this and moves it a little bit is not enough that it'll stay there. And that used to happen to us, those were impurities. But if you take a random atom and you ask it to stay there, then that's very difficult. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, it depends on what the impurity is. It, uh, um, I don't know what boron is. I can tell you nitrogen. Nitrogen is the vacancy. So nitrogen is a hole, All right? So it, I, I, I mean, you can you can stick something in its place. That's probably boron. You can, or you can put an interstitial. Nitrogen is in the middle between the two, and it squeezes the cell just a little bit. It depends on which side of carbon it is. It's just a normal semiconductor type. Sort of the same way with anesthesia, you carry it Absolutely. That's the, exactly the way they carry them, yes. Okay. Well, then, please yeah. let's thank Harris again. Thank you. Is that okay? And, and we do have some refreshments outside. And you can come down here and, and look at some of those diamonds if you want.